Welcome back to the Zizzo Effect podcast. This season, we're exploring the unique insights from every level within call center organizations, from the top down. Today, we've got a real treat. Jim Ayub, the Chief Customer Officer at eTech, is our special guest. Jim is a true expert in the call center industry, and we're excited to hear his thoughts on the modern challenges surrounding the workforce and workplace in the industry. So get ready, it's game time. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Zizzo Effect podcast. I am your host, Jimmy Shabbat, uh, CEO and founder of Zizzo Technologies. And today we have a special guest, Jim Ayub. He is the chief customer officer at eTech. He's a powerhouse in the customer experience world and has so much great experience and advice to give us. Jim, you're also a good friend of mine. We've met uh, quite a few years ago in Nashville and have been friends ever since and also now becoming partners with Zizzo Technologies. Jim, welcome to the uh, Zizzo Effect Podcast. Oh, Jimmy, thank you so much. It's so great to see you. And man, I've been following you since we met and just impressed with all the things you're doing as well in the community. I think that's why God put us together because we both have a lot of the same beliefs, which is people yes. and communities. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, that, and that's one of the reasons why I brought you on to this uh, show. You're not only that, but you're so passionate about it the same way that I am. And I think you have a lot of great things to tell our audience, to share with our audience and your experience. Before we get into your experience, Jim, tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are personally. Again, Jim Ayub, Chief Customer Officer at eTech. I've been in industry for 30 some years. Believe it or not, I started my career at Dun & Bradstreet as a call center agent. And what's funny about it is not a lot of people have moved up the world like I did, but mm -hmm. understanding all the things we said we used to give our people uh, <laughs> is kind of where it got my vision. But I've been with Matt Rocco, who I know you know is our president and CEO. So think about this. I was in Pennsylvania. I'm not from Texas, as you can tell from this accent. Uh, I worked for him for a mm -hmm. while, and he moved to Nacogdoches, Texas, where ETEX headquartered. And I came down 30 days later, still with the same guy. I mean, two, two technical jobs in my life, really. Dunham Bradstreet and eTech, and uh, love it. Love my job every day. That's rare to see that people stay in the same job for the same company for such a long period of time, uh, especially in this day and age where people just move around and change careers so frequently. Uh, but going back to you personally, Jim, you said you grew up in Pennsylvania. You're, I know now you're down in Austin, Texas. Uh, tell us about yourself personally and give us a, a nice fun fact as well. I know you've got a bunch. Yeah, I have so many. So uh, I have... Three kids, believe it or not, 36-year-old with two grandkids. I have a 22-year-old who still lives here, Jimmy, and you probably get this because she says she's never leaving. She has it too good. And I have a 16-year-old who's learning to drive, and Daddy won't teach her. Um, <laughs> fun, fact, fun fact is the people who do know me, I dabble uh, at the casino once in a while. I have two slot machines that I just bought my wife for her, her 25th anniversary. I have a crap stable upstairs. Uh, I enjoy data so much. I use data to make decisions. So, uh, and I do, I am a sushi chef. So uh, I nice. love to make sushi. Yeah. Yeah. D Dabble might be the understatement of the year there. I mean, if, <laughs> if you've got craps tables, uh, you've got uh, machines in your house. I think dabbling is, is, is just understating that whole fact. Uh, well, again, Jim, thanks so much for coming on. Um, to, you know, today in our episode and what we've been doing for this season is we're trying to get different perspectives about some of the same topics. And what we talk about perspective, we're looking at from the agent perspective, you know, the people, the frontline workers, the people on the ground floor and, you know, doing the work. And then their managers, you know, how they see it, because we believe that everybody sees things from their unique angles. And you are the executive perspective, you know, above the trees, in the clouds, what you see, what problems you're dealing with. And how do you perceive these different topics like culture, engagement, distractions, work from home and things of that nature? Um, so first, you know, because I know that you had said it in the beginning of the, uh, of the episode here, you talked about how we both truly believe in culture. And so I want to get your take on first, how do you define culture? So it's, it's really an interesting topic because at the end of the day, 
I mean, like you said in the beginning, like, why would I be with somebody? And it's really the same boss. Why would I be with somebody for over 30 years? It's because if you work for a culture driven organization who puts people first, which is, is not really heard of in the contact center industry, in my opinion, um, I think culture is basically the heartbeat of that organization. And what, when I talk about culture, it's what are your principles and guiding principles? So fortunately for us, we think of a servant leadership mentality, right? So we have 12 character commitments. We have a dean of leadership development. Her only job is to teach our leaders about culture hmm. and our 12 character commitments. And we come with taking care of the needs of others first everything will fall on the line. So my definition of culture would be defined as taking care of the needs of others before yourself. And that's what designs a great culture environment, which lets people talk transparently about things they like, things they don't like, and what you can do as an individual to help them. Because it's beyond the answering phone calls. It's mm -hmm. giving people things that they can do better in their lives. It, you had something very, said something very important there, which is, you know, you have a dean who's responsible for teaching leadership, right? Because I also believe, like, you can't just, you know, put a poster up on the wall and say, here are our traits, you know, here's our, uh, uh, our pillars of what we believe in and what defines our culture. You actually have to do it. And as being up above the clouds, you're not, you're not in the weeds every day, right? So you have to talk to the people who are in the weeds. And it, it, tell us about that kind of that transition of knowledge and that transition of culture. And what sort of discussions do you have with your leadership team? I'm assuming your management team. Um, and how does that cascade down to the frontline workers? Yeah, so it's a great question. So you met Melissa, by the way, in mm -hmm. Nashville. She was, the, she was there. And I mean, that's her full-time job. And what she does is they have aspiring leader program. So first and foremost, I think one of the mistakes we've all made in our business is we promote people who probably shouldn't have been promoted out of need, right? Companies are growing. So one of the processes we have is in order to become a leader at eTech, you actually need to go through aspiring leadership program where they have structured programs to teach you the culture, the why. Why is this important? And she actually focuses, she has a team of people as well. What they do is they talk about values and talk about why this job is important. You're not just answering a phone call for a person. You're solving their problem. Think about internet as an example. It's supposed to be a God-given right. I think some people think about when it goes down. But let's be honest, it's not. It's not a, it's right. Not a right. Okay, but how do you, t you're, you're solving somebody's issues, whether they're going to school, whether they have to get something done, and you have to have these culture champions. So once you get these people embraced in the culture, you create, a program for them to be culture champions. And then you have recognition. I mean, one of the things eTech does is we have, I don't want to call it a contest, but uh, it's, it's more of an award ceremony. So every year we have 12 character commitments and you're literally voting almost like American Idol, except we're not voting you off the island. Uh, we're voting, you're voting for these people who demonstrate that character commitment uh, and it's all your peers. So it's not the sea levels deciding this. It's all of the people that are working for you that are deciding these peers that makes this process more engaging, right? It helps team members give recognition to the people who are doing it right. And then, of course, when you're doing it right, you want to recognize that person for doing it right. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, uh, there's so many great takeaways there, and I want to point a few of them out. I think it's really important and when you said we teach the why, I mean, that is so critical. I mean, if you really want to transfer the knowledge, you don't just tell people how to do it, right? Because it's like a step-by-step -step instruction. And when something does go wrong, they're not able to troubleshoot what's happened. But when you try to get them to understand why you do it and the outcomes that, may, that are supposed to come out of it, and then what happens when you do it wrong, what are the outcomes that usually wind up happening? And so... Uh, so I wanted to point that out. I think that's a very critical piece in, you know, being able to cascade your uh, your 12 character commitments, as you put it, down all the way through the entire ecosystem. Uh, but you also said another thing that I think is ubiquitous within not just call center space, but all larger or growing organizations is that most people who get promoted to managers, they're not formally trained. 
right? They're, you know, usually they're doing a great job. They're doing their job very well and you don't want to lose them. And they're, you know, there's no mm-hmm. path to growth. So usually you, they get promoted, they put into a leadership role and then you're kind of winging it. And so what do you do in those moments? I mean, what are the first things you address? I mean, there's the people skills, obviously. How do you identify if they possess the people skills? Um, uh, you're teaching them your your values and, you know, how you want them to lead. But what do you do in terms of, you know, the communication, you know, between them and the their direct reports? Yeah, so the communication is important. And, and I have a simple analogy. I'll take will over skill any day because if you have the will, I can teach you skills, right? And the communication is probably, that's like the biggest thing. So how do you fix communication? Well, you could do it with newsletters, which we do. We also have company updates quarterly where the executive teams come out and we let our team speak. We're there to listen to them. So we have other people. We pick somebody new every time for the town halls to speak about their departments. And that's kind of where you get to see the future up and comers, number one, right? Number two, it gets you to try them and see what they're able to do from a presentation perspective and the date and how they're getting to it. And you can hear and see in the chats and all the people going around there, right? We believe in a one e-tech mindset. So you know we're global, Mm -hmm. right? So e-tech has 3,600 team members in three countries. How do you keep that one e-tech going in communication? Well, we have a swap program. So we have corporate houses in our uh, foreign places. So we send U.S. leaders at all times to our India locations. They usually do six months to a year. We do the same in our Jamaica. And vice versa, we bring people from Jamaica to the U.S. for usually three to six months. And the same from India. As a matter of fact, like uh, I have two people that I've just relocated to the U.S. in the last 10 years. One of our VPs hired him in 2003 as a manager for me when I was living in India. And 10 years ago, I brought him and his family to the US. He still runs India from here, but he lives in Dallas, Texas now. His kid's going to school here and blah, blah, blah. I just did the same with one of our developers, which you know my development teams, you've worked with them. Mm -hmm. I just relocated his family here, but he was in India. So that's how you, so if you think about it, and and I know it probably offends some people, but let's be honest. The American culture has a lot of positives, but we also have a lot of negatives. The Indian culture has lots of positives, but also lots of negatives. But the holy grail is, can I get both cultures merged together and focus on all the positives by minimizing the negatives? And that's how we would do it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we do it. And the last but not least, I would tell you, is we use a methodology called direct feedback model. So direct feedback model is literally being the ability to give people direct feedback. (laughs) And typically for me, You know, we're used to in the old days, that sandwich theory, you know, talk about the positives, talk about the opportunities end with the positives. I was never a big believer in that. Um, We do direct feedback model. And more importantly, when you build the relationship with someone, they want the feedback direct. Tell me what I'm doing good. Tell me what I'm not doing good. And then, you know, how can I improve it? And that's kind of why we rolled out that direct feedback model across our entire organization to be able to communicate transparently Mm -hmm. with the opportunities and what you can do as an individual to obviously get better. And and the other thing I would tell you is I believe development, 90% on the individual you're developing, 10% for me as the leader. I'm going to direct you because now if you give them goals to go out and achieve reading a book, going to a class, doing a certification, if they do it again, I go back to that's will. Mm-hmm. They want to do a great job. And that's kind of some of the things we do from the communication standpoint. Yeah. Will over skill. I like that. Uh, love that. A couple things I want to touch on and, and, you know, leadership being one of them that you just mentioned there. But with the feedback loop, you talk about providing that direct feedback. And I know we're working together on making that yep. feedback loop as, in, as close to real time as possible. Right. And we're going to want to scale that hopefully across your entire organization. And But what are you doing now in some of those departments where Zizzo is not implemented, where how quickly is that feedback loop? How quickly are you and how frequently are you providing feedback? I mean, it's with over 3,000 employees, you can't do it on a daily basis. So talk to me about that. Yeah, it's almost, so here's the problem with the, with the contact center. 
and, and I'll probably offend some more people here. We say we're doing it, but you know, just like you and I believe yeah. it, mm-hmm. as an executive, yeah, I'm coaching. But is it effective? Are you giving effective feedback? You're counting on them to tell you what, they're done, what they've done. Where I think the benefit of why we're partnering with you is, I believe that 90% of the employee wants to do a good job. There's always a percentage that doesn't. We get that. But I think most of them come to work that says, I want to do a good job. We also say this myth that we're giving you the tools to be successful. Coaching once a day, once a week is not, in my opinion, effective. And I do see during COVID, which is why we're so excited about an appointment with you, during COVID, when we went remotely, because remember, we have brick and mortar centers. So we were forced to go COVID to remote. All the stats went up, Jimmy, as we all know, right? Why? Because it was a honeymoon. Yeah. And I remember these conversations saying, I'm telling you, these agents are not getting coached, right? And I don't believe that you could be, not everybody can work remotely. Not everybody can work from home. So you have to have those guide rails in there to get that data. So what I did at eTech is I launched an agent portal where I was providing agents feedback. More, I shouldn't say feedback. It's not as good as what you guys are doing, but I was giving them data to tell them what they did well and what they're not doing well and gave them 30-second, 45-second micro-learning labs. Hmm. And what we found was more than 70% of the workforce was actually clicking through because they wanted the feedback. Mm -hmm. And then again, you go to the managers. I think feedback's a gift, which we all talk about, and if you want to receive it. But you can't just do it one way. It can't just be a one-on-one session with you and me every day. Hey, Jimmy, let me pull you over here. Let's listen to this call. Let's look at what you did well. I think people want more coaching, Mm -hmm. and I think they want more feedback. So the ability to give it to them in real time is huge, but I will caution people because I've written blogs on this. When I talk about feedback, I don't believe in the agent assist as much as everybody else is believing. Like, listen, I'm going to tell the agent during the call where they should go. All right, let's be honest. The agent has 20 screens open already because based on your technology, they have to process this order. I have to go through 15 different websites and screens to get it. And on top of that, while they're having a relationship building conversation with a customer, you want to pop something to the screen and tell them where to go. <laughs> I, I disagree with that mentality. I'm all about real time, almost real time. So if you had the interaction, they did okay, but they could have done better. What can I give them in the moment? Because they're going to remember that call they just hung up, mm-hmm. right? Right. So if I give them that opportunity to do some type of gamification, which mm-hmm. you know I'm a big fan of, some type of little bit of a feedback, and again, same concept with the micro-learning, little bits, mm-hmm they're going to be great in a week to 10 days or whatever the case may be versus just shooting from the hip saying, yeah, I coached him five times this week. I agree with you. And, and we've talked about this extensively in, in your belief in gamification, but more so about that transparency, that feedback loop. The gamification aspect of it is really just the novel part of CISO, yep. right? It's the recognition, the rewards. But the feedback loop of, hey, you did good, and here are your expectations, and here was where you are relative to those expectations. Um, so it gives people a goal to shoot for, a target to shoot for each and every day. And you know, even when they do hit their targets, you know, we we implement things to, to eliminate complacency, right? So that way, hey, yep. here's another goal, here's a stretch goal, here's more rewards attached to it. But you had said something earlier in terms of you know when you put out those micro learning sessions, and you measured. The, the you know the engagement with that right so I always ask the question with people uh, when people say hey I don't want Zizzo to be a distraction I always come back my rebuttal is well can you define engagement from your perspective and you know tell me what engagement means to you so engagement means so again I started my career as an agent so if we're going to be honest with the world it's probably one of the most under recognized job in the industry because it's repetitive. It's boring. I'm tied to my headset all day. And by the way, yeah, I know people are out there saying, but we have wireless headsets. I'm still tied to it. Let's be clear Mm -hmm. because I'm wireless too. But I think what the increased engagement that I talk about, let's take a boring job that's repetitive, non-rewarding. And how do I make it fun? 
so that my people are not bored every day and looking on Indeed to find another job. Because I think when you engage the employee to make it more of a fun environment, I think your retention would fix, be fixed as well. And you know us, we, we're big in the corporate branding. I have, as you know, every time you see me, I have a new shirt, mm -hmm. right? So what we're looking forward with you guys is these shirts right now you can buy at eTech, right? So employees like to have that brand, but they're doing it like every six weeks. Well, I'm imagining if I can, an agent can earn, right, rewards and buy more of this merchandise, it's doing two things. One is giving them something concrete they can take home, mm -hmm. number one. And you can get TVs and all the other things we talk about. But I'm a big believer in marketing, right, branding. <laughs> so if they get more of these shirts, it's going to be more out in the community, which are going to say, man, this looks like a fun company, right? Yep. And, and you take away that boring... I mean, think about password reset be the easiest one for me to talk about. Okay, people are calling to reset their password. That's got to be monotonous. Yeah. You're doing the same thing. You've lost your password. We know why you lost it. You forgot, right? And you're just doing that every day. So how can I make that a little, uh, just a little bit more enjoyable? Mm -hmm. And that's what engagement is about. It's a good point. You, you bring up, I think, one of the things that we always try to address, which is the repeatable task, right? Uh, it's, this, it's mundane. It's the same thing each and every day. And it leads to burnout. So burnout was something that has always been part of, uh, I think, the formula of HR planning, right? In, you know, how do you yep. manage your workforce? You understand that you're going to get a certain percentage of people, even the people who have been with you for a long time, they're going to eventually burn out. But burnout is happening much, much faster nowadays. And I think it has a lot to do with technology and, and just our attention spans, right? Especially the newer generation. How do you see burnout from your, I mean, over the gen, over your career, you've been in this space for a long time. You've seen the evolution, you know, whether it's generational or whether it's, you know, workplace, you know, from work from in-house to uh, from your house or remote. Uh, how do you, how do you see per burnout in today's day and age and how has that evolved? Yeah. So I think if you look at burnout, people get bored. Like we talked about when you engage them, there's a couple things that we do successfully. Number one, when I'm engaging my employees and showing them a career path, right? A career path goes from agent to assistant to a senior agent to uh, you know potentially management or even moving into the data analytics side, right? So I talk about it as skills development, right? Because we can teach skills, like we said, right? Will, I can't teach. Skill, mm -hmm. I can't. If you continue to teach them skills and they see the career path, right? That's going to remove some of the burnout. And by the mm -hmm. way, it doesn't mean everybody's going to be promoted, but I will tell you this year alone, I promoted over 190 people in my organization. My director of insights who does all my analytics, he was an agent 10 years ago. Today he's a director. My vice president of customer success, when I joined eTech in 2000, he was one of my agents. He's a VP now. Chandra, who I know you've met, my, v my SVP mm -hmm. of AppX, yep. she started as an agent. So it's really important to use these tools to avoid burnout by what's in it for them, not what's in it for me, what's in mm -hmm. it for them. And again, not everybody likes the career path, but I think skills development is, is imperative in this business. It's kind of like if you've seen, I wrote a blog which got a bunch of bad press. Um, when I say <laughs> bad press, people arguing with me because everybody's talking about, to your point, AI. Yes. AI is not replacing your job. What's going to replace your job is people who don't embrace AI. Yep. Because AI is a tool, like anything else, that enhances what you can do. It's not replacing you. And when you think about this customer experience, which everybody talks about, mm -hmm. the more engaged your agent becomes, the better that customer experience is. And people ask me all the time, it's like, so what? Well, here's the difference. So being a 32-year-plus veteran in the contact center industry, yeah, 20 years ago, it was okay for me to be on hold at American Express for 20 minutes because I had nothing else to do. Hmm. <laughs> but today, nothing's going to change. So what's changed in our business? Customers' expectations have changed. Mm -hmm. The business itself, we're still answering the same phone call, still doing it in chat, doing an omni-channel, still do. The only difference is I have a laptop now versus green screens, because believe it or not, when I was an agent, I had green screens, right? And really what's changed, to your point, this newer generation, I have a 22-year-old, remember. 
their attention span is that of a goldfish, which is seven seconds. Yep. So the better your agent is to solve the opportunity or issue or whatever you want to call it in the politically correct world, the better that experience is because as a customer, as a consumer in a global marketplace, I can get your product from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So the only differentiator you have is that customer experience, which brings back to engaged employees, engaged people, and people who are getting better at their job every day. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think as the world goes more and more online, right? Retail goes online, banking goes online, you know, everybody's shopping online. And so therefore you're going to need more support staff, which, you know, I, I I see a lot of the omni-channel support, you know, where you're getting it through text messages or through chat, but you said it, you know, you're not going to replace the human, not anytime soon. I think people will even nope. recognize, even if you're going to use AI, you know, for that low hanging fruit, I still want to talk to a person, even back in the days where they're asking you questions and I just keep pressing zero, zero, operator, <laughs> operator, get me to a human. Um, but I want to touch on a point to elaborate a little bit more. You had mentioned part of the success of your organization is that the, you have, you provide a career path and you provide career opportunities within the same organization. And agents should always be looked at as feeders for all your next level. Um, but that requires investment. And I think you pointed out a few ways how you can identify who's worthy of being invested in. You can measure their will. You can measure their commitment to the organization when they speak publicly uh, in your public forum. Uh, it, you know, you're able to identify whether or not they have leadership skills. When you do identify them, how much time do you commit to training them on future skills that are going to be required uh, for them to take jobs? And, and do you automatically identify what position that you're looking at, or do you just globally make sure that they they have all the different uh, skill sets that they're going to need for the different positions? Yeah. So it's a great question. Believe it or not, during the interview, we start looking during the interview process. Hmm. So during the interview process, our recruiters, we have something different too. So the person who hires you is the hiring manager. We don't have HR doing it. And HR does a lot of the paperwork, but the guy who you're going to be working for is makes the final decision of who I'm going to hire. And during that, we have a process that says getting to know you. So in that getting to know you session, we're asking some questions. What is your two-year goal, three-year goal, five-year goal? So now let's just take some basic information. Oh, Jimmy, so you're engaged. You're looking to get married. So now I know that. So now I'm going to tell you there's a career opportunity because you're starting in the beginning. And then we basically see your interest in that. And then we mm. flag that to say, okay, Jimmy's interested in the promotion because he's getting married in a year. So now we know that about you. As far as the training, then we put you through a rigorous, it's about a six week course, but I want to be cautious of that because I'm not taking you out of production for six weeks to okay. train you. Yeah. We're taking you off an hour here, two hours there. Sometimes it's a one day session twice a month. Okay. And we're giving you those tools as you're still being a productive employee to then you have to be certified and pass this aspiring leadership. And then mm -hmm. there's a certification process that says you have demonstrated you can do this skill. We do skill transfer. So if you're going to be coaching somebody, you have to demonstrate for the trainers that you can actually take that feedback we talk about and deliver it to somebody. And then that's how you're getting your, cert your certifications, which then allows you to go to the next. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly enough, you ask, because I have three departments, right? We have three divisions of our company. We have the call center, the analytics, which is under me, and the developers that are under me. So believe it or not, the best analytics people in the business all came from ops. Hmm. Because they were doing the job. Hmm. They're the ones that say, this is how it would have been better, <laughs> right? So that's the other thing. And some people are just data nerds, mm -hmm. right? Developer coders. And believe it or not, they're getting an agent job to buy beer money or whatever, right? Extra money. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones telling us, man, I went to school for computer programming, but I have no prospect out there. And those people are huge to get into the technology division. And last but not least, some of our cybersecurity people, best ones we hired, zero call center experience, came in as an agent, 
just a genius when it comes to cybersecurity. You know, our, our chief security officer is like, man, I want put, they put them in an internship. Mm -hmm. So now I've taken you from an agent to an intern. We take you through the security stuff, and then we see, and then you obviously get promoted up into a full-time job in the security division. It's a diverse background, so think about all the different people that are out there that are taking these jobs because mm -hmm. they have to supply for their family. But the only way to understand that, to answer your question, is having conversations with them to see what everything is about. Yeah. I, and again, I, that's focused on them instead of me. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, we went through a generation, I think our generation, where work-life balance was very important. And, but, you know, what you just talked about is something that I've seen happening more and more, which is work-life integration. Right? And, you know, one of our other guests, uh, earlier guests, you know, had said the same thing is, you know, with the agent, we when we asked them from their perspective and we said, what could leadership do, you know, to keep you engaged, to keep you loyal, to keep you there for longer? And he had said, ask me how I'm doing. Ask me what's going on in my life. And, you know, what you just said there just kind of solidifies that as well. And but also marries the two. Right. What is going on in your life and how can we help you achieve those personal goals, those life goals? You know, you're getting married. You want to buy a house. OK, let's set a career path for you. Yep. Um, and you're absolutely right from the perspective, like nobody's going to school and getting educated on call center work, right? <laughs> there is no major in college for contact center. So you're getting them from all walks of life. You're getting people, uh, you know, when I was, you know, I had ran my own operations, I had a lot of people who were college educated, couldn't find a job in their field and just came here as a job, as a temporary job, but excelled. Yep. Right. And then you just try to find a role for them in the future because, you know, they're not going to stay forever. Nobody's going to be an agent for their entire career, especially if they have uh, a lot more to, to give as a as an as an employee. I want to shift gears a little bit here and, you know, talk about, you know, remote work. You had talked about, you know, you guys went remote only when, you know, required. Have you came back? How's you, how are you doing, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, your, your workforce, how, what percentage of them are in-house full-time, what percentage is hybrid, what percentage is remote full-time? Yeah. So we're probably 80% back in the centers. Um, and this is just, it's not because we can't do it with technology. It's just one of our beliefs. Mm -hmm. Our belief in remote workers is you have to earn the right to be remote, right? So if you come into our centers and you're doing a great job, meeting all your KPIs, exceeding the KPIs, showing up, doing things, you deserve the opportunity to work from home because you've proven you can do it. And that's really what our, our mindset is. Mm -hmm. Now, developers and some of my data people who are pulling reports, yeah, those people can be remote because there's this task-driven more or less. Mm -hmm. I just need to get my stuff delivered. So those people we do remotely. But what we found is even during COVID, when we had so many people, that, con that connection was lost. It's not the same calling you up and saying, hey, how was your weekend? Where when you're in the center, I can walk by, hey, buddy, how's it going? How was your weekend? What'd you do? Did you do how was your football team? Whatever. It's harder to do that remotely in our opinion. And by the way, mm -hmm. I know there's companies out there that are 100% remote and they do a great job. Um, and I'm sure they do. It's just not eTech's belief to be 100% remote because we want to have that relationship and we want to have that ability to have a relationship with our employees, which is harder to do when you're remote. Yeah. I, for the record, I'm 100% in alignment with you. I, I think there's, you had said it earlier, the honeymoon phase where it's like, oh my God, we're working from home. You know, I can roll out of bed. I don't have to get dressed. I don't have to drive if you have a long commute. Uh, yeah. you know, you, you can, you know, do your laundry at the same time. And I think people really tried hard in the beginning. Uh, then it, it, it lost its, uh, it lost its oomph, you know, and, and, but a lot of companies struggled to bring their workforce back. You know, the workers revolted and said, no, if you're yep. not going to keep me remote, I'm going to find a company that does hire for remote and I'm going to go there and it caused a lot of attrition. Uh, how did you get? your staff back into the office? Yeah. So great question. So I think, and you're right, we did lose some people who took jobs from some of our competitors because they offered the remote. Mm -hmm. um, I think it goes back to what we talked about originally. 
because I've lost some employees, by the way. I've lost in my own organization. I mean, I've lost guys who are getting paid double what we paid them. And the funny part about it is, to this day, some of these people who left me for money have tried to come back. Some of them I bring back. Uh, matter of fact, one, I just had a call recently with this guy. He got 2.5 times his salary. So, I, by the way, I said, by all means, you should go. Absolutely love you to death. I would never match that. You should mm -hmm. go, right? So he goes to this company for six months. He gets, re he gets removed. He comes back to me and says, man, I'll take you back in a heartbeat. And I gave him a little bit of a bump from what he left me at. He's like, but I was making this. But you're unemployed now, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right? So, so I think it goes back to that culture. Yes. Because everybody thinks the grass is green around the other side. Mm -hmm. But if you have built a culture of caring individual people and taking care of your people like people, mm -hmm. not machines and robots and everything else and taking advantage of them and being a dictatorship, I think that's really what happens. And that's how we got a lot of them back. Now, to answer your question, some people have work-life balance that's important, kids, schools, whatever. So we like the hybrid model for them. As long as you come in once, twice a week, and you tell me when you can come in, by the way, because that's the other thing we found. Like when we said, hey, you need to come in on Monday and Wednesday. <laughs> that didn't work as well for us <laughs> because we should have said, what days are you committing to come into the office? And then you've agreed to that. Yeah. So then it's easier to do some type of hybrid with that. Um, but we didn't pay any extra money. I do know some tests that went on. Friends of mine in the contact center industry, they tried to bring everybody back and everybody says, no, I want to stay home. So then they offered $2 more an hour to come back in site. And like 60% of them decided to do that. But she said it didn't really affect the production, by the way. Mm -hmm. Those people that came back in for that $2, it didn't really give that person a lift. Yeah, It didn't really help them. She's like, it was kind of, we should have just made them come back in. So we didn't offer bribes or anything is my point. We just basically says, listen, this is part of our business. We want to have you on site. We'll work with you. And that's kind of how we did it. So many things you and I agree upon, which is, I think, what makes us great friends. Because um, I had the same experience. We were, you know, I would, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I got offered more money. And I'd say, look, that's not in our model. You know, we, and if you can go get that, 100% go get it. And we'd have the same people, same thing happen. They'd come back. I didn't like that culture. I didn't like, it was a, it was a shit show. It was just crazy. There was no accountability. Um, I didn't feel like I was part of a family. And so I do believe that creating that family environment, that culture that you're not just a number, you know, you do matter here. We, you know, you're friends with the people that you work with. We, we treat our people like family. We care about your family the way we would. Um, and I think there has to be that, that flexibility, that balance, but you're right. It's not for everybody. It has to be earned. Um, you could treat it as a perk and that's something that yep. we encourage to put into the reward store in, in, in Zizzo, which is, hey, earn enough coins or Z-Bucks and you can buy your right I to work that. from home, you know, and uh, yeah. and you can customize. So that way they have to earn the right. And then once they've done it, they can buy it if that's what they, if that's what important to them. Uh, so working from home, so you, you still have, what do you think is the biggest challenge? I mean, there's, there's the tail end of the honeymoon, right? And there was a point right before you decided, okay, this can't continue. We have to bring him back. What was the biggest challenge that you thought? And what were the, the biggest reason that forced you to say, okay, they got to come back? Yeah, probably because, you know, I'm a data person. Mm -hmm. The data tells a story. Sure. It's the data decisions. So in the beginning, that honeymoon period, right? More log time more things because they were home. They had to walk from their bedroom to their office. So yeah, hmm. log time went up. All the results went up the first couple of weeks. But then what we saw in the data, the data was telling me it was going down. Log time might've been there, but performance might've been down. So I think that's probably one of the opportunities. And like I said, not everybody's disciplined enough mm -hmm. to work from home. Um, that's probably the biggest challenge I thought I saw was you can't be inspired in my opinion all the time when you're home alone, kids, distractions, all sorts of things, looking out the window. I mean, let's be transparent. I go cut my grass in the middle of the day. 
sometimes, right? <laughs> if I have no calls, I'm going to go yeah. outside, cut my grass, smoke a cigar, right? But I come back and do my job, right? But not everybody can do that. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge we've seen. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be at my level, and you know I'm a pretty fun guy. I can self-amuse myself. Like, I don't need people to be patting me on the back and telling me all the great things and, because I can do that myself. So I yeah. think for me, I'm, I'm a unique individual, and there are unique people that can do it. Like Chandra, who's my SVP, she works from home. She, she gets her job done. She's self, I mean, I guess self-awareness in her is like, listen, I got to get this done. If I get it done by 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock, it still gets done. But not everybody has that. So I think that mm -hmm. was like the biggest challenge. The data told me a story mm -hmm. that looked really good, but then it plateaued, and then it started coming down. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people experience that same thing. And, and I even will challenge that a lot of the reason that spike in productivity is most of our job is about contactability. Well, if you're outbound, right? And if everybody's home, <laughs> it's up and you know, it's impossible not to be able to get a hold of somebody. Well, not impossible, but it's it's much easier. Yep. So it did spike in, you know, uh, some of that data may have been flawed or or looked at for the wrong reason as positive. Um, I do want to go to change topics for a second. And you had mentioned earlier where one of your peers in the space offered $2 an hour more, you know, for people to come into office. And, you know, that didn't really motivate them or, or move the needle in terms of productivity. It just productivity. It was more of a, you know, <clears throat> a way just to get them back into the office. Correct. So, talk to me about compensation versus incentives. I think you have a model where you're pretty, you know exactly what people deserve to earn, you know, what the market is paying. And even if the market is overpaying, you're not willing to compromise your business model because you know at some point that's just uh, you're just going to lose, but you are willing to put money into incentives. You guys have had a reward program for a long time. Talk to me about the difference between compensation and incentives and how you feel about uh, what's more important. Yeah. So I, I don't think one is more important than the other. I think you first have to start with compensation. You have to give people enough to be able to come to work, provide for their family. Mm -hmm. And you need to give them an opportunity to make more money, cash money, based on their performance and meeting those KPIs. What I think is funny, before I get into the next part of it, is like our agents think we should just give them raises all the time. Our customers are not giving us raises. So at what point do you want me to pay that customer to take their calls? And when <laughs> you tell them with my, our direct feedback model, which kind of works, like some people have told me, like when, I, when they said, man, I need to make more money, like you're only paying me X and you know I need to make Y. And I'm like, yeah, but our customer pays us Z. So at what point do you want me to pay them to take their calls? And they kind of appreciate that. Yep. So you have to give them a fair wage. But we're huge believers in incentives. And, you know, Matt's wife runs, as you know, you've, you've, you've talked to our team who runs that unique boutique store. Mm -hmm. That is something different because on top of the money, now you earn rewards. So there's a couple of reasons we do this. Number one, it's physical, right? And I know a shirt's not as physical. I like to, I have like lots of stuff, but I will tell you, we have TVs, cups. we have, you know, cups. Oh yeah. You got the cups too. We got, we got all those type of things, but you can get like laptops and we believe if you stay with us long enough, cause remember you earn these points and these incentives as you continue to do your job and you can build a bank. So at Christmas time, if, if you've earned thousands of these rewards, you can exchange them for gifts, Christmas presents. That's real stuff. Mm -hmm. So that when the, we believe, um, like that's why a lot of people buy TVs. So we believe this. So let's say Jimmy's working for the call center and he got a TV he earned in addition to everything we paid him. When he's home telling his wife he wants to quit, his wife's looking at that 70 inch TV saying, wait a minute, <laughs> is that where, isn't that where he got this TV? So we like material things in addition to the e-tech merchandise stuff. And we believe that is in, in addition to, but we also know the, how incentives work, competition. So when you can earn extra stuff by having a competition, and, and I know games are really fun with that. I mean, in the old days before you existed, I remember I used to bring, because I had Brianna, who was my, I think, five, six-year-old at the time. 
she had that little battery-operated fishing game. And I used to take the fishes out, and I would put stuff underneath, a piece of tape with prizes. And then every time you did something good, we took that fishing game for the five-year-old to your game, and you got to fish out a prize. And people were always competing against that, just like hot potato. But now mm -hmm. you've digitized it for us yep. to make it much easier, because I do believe that you could drive extra rewards. And by the way, competition is good because we're all ego driven, which none mm -hmm. of us want to admit, right? But all the best of the best have egos. And when yeah. you're having competition, I think that's what gives those extra rewards out. So yeah. we believe in all three. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, and, and by the way, when our, our, a lot of our customers supply us with stuff. Nice. So like our customers, when they come to us and they'll say, listen, we're going to pay you X plus Y plus Z. And we want to give $1,000 per month to all of our employees in there to do whatever you want with. Mm -hmm. We put those into the systems that you can earn. That's how you do all those extra competitions. Hey, today mm -hmm. we're going to give away 100 of this or 200 of this or whatever of this. And I think that actually builds more morale in the contact center as well. Yeah. And, and, and I think you and I both agree that, you know, you want to make that competition as fair as possible and as inclusive yep. as possible. So that way everybody's able to participate. One of the challenges with kind of gamified cultures is if you're running the same types of contests and it's the same people that are winning all the time, it actually, Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, you're, you're demotivating the majority you of your staff. So I think it's important to be able to find ways to include everybody so that way they're always winning. And I love your model, which is something that we have as well, which is the reward store. Micro rewards, yep. let them build up, buy what you want, not what we think you need. Want to shift gears. Uh, we've got you know just a handful of minutes here left, and I want to touch on a topic that's, that's really uh, become more and more important in today's society. And I think in the workplace, where people are paying closer attention, which is uh, mental health. Uh, there's a statistics that says that 60% of employees have never spoken to anyone at work about their mental health. Uh, but it's it, it impacts, right? Uh, we used to have a philosophy where it's like, hey, leave your home life at the door, but also leave your work life at the door when you leave. You know, Don't bring the stresses of work home because we want you to, that's the work-life balance. Yep. Does your company... Um, have a strategy and addresses mental health issue in today's day and age? We do. So what eTech has put together was community action teams. So CAT teams, you know, we all love acronyms, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> community action teams. And e there's one for like rewards and recognition. There's one for mental health and, and employee assistance. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, they have different groups of these people that are made up of our employees. So, our HR team is awesome. They have a, their own wellness site. Um, they have their own wellness newsletter. They do these things in all of our contact centers, which is they bring in volunteers, either doctors, chiropractors, dentists. I mean, anything that has to do with mental health and mental wellness. And they have mental wellness days, usually once every six weeks, eight weeks, mm -hmm. where we bring not e-tech employees from outside, <laughs> outside professionals in we pay them to come in and basically an employee can go talk to them for anything, right? Hmm. And where those ideas come from are those community action teams, right? So we are embraced in health and wellness mm -hmm. because by the way, as a, as a company, you know this, I'm diabetic, right? So it's going to cost this company much more money if I don't take care of myself. And I will give you a live example. We have personal wellness coaches and and you've known me for, God, 10, think at least 10 years in the industry. And you said me last time I saw you in Austin, man, you look great. You lost a lot of weight. Let me tell you the secret. So first of all, I hate working out. It's not even on my top 100 list, right? <laughs> and I love to eat, as you know. <laughs> so my boss gave me a personal wellness coach. So this personal wellness coach calls me up and they say to me, you know, fill out this intake. So I filled out all the stuff. And they get me on the phone and they say, listen, we want you to start walking. I said, you're on crack. There's no way I'm going out walking a mile a day. So what was cool about it, which really made me different, was they asked me my eating habits. They asked me all these things. And then she basically said, she customized it. She says, I'll tell you what. Will you commit? Because she knows I work from home. Will you commit to leaving your water? Because I do drink about two gallons of water a day because I love water. Will you commit to leaving your water cup? 
not on your desk in the kitchen. Absolutely. So it forced me to walk little by little. Mm -hmm. And then I told her about I cutting my grass and smoking a cigar. <laughs> so she's like, let's get you to cut the grass twice a week. I can do that because I'm smoking two cigars, <laughs> right? So it was this package that was really geared towards me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like my daughter has, a, she goes to the gym every day. She's a workout crazy person, six o'clock in the morning. I could never do that. And when I admitted that, that's kind of how this thing happened for me. And you've seen I've lost like 30 pounds. I've mm -hmm. gone down four inches off my waist. And all I'm doing is these, and then every week she would try to push me a little bit more. Hey, let's walk around the house. <laughs> okay, I can do that, right? Because I'm in the air conditioning, right? So, so those are the kind of things we do in addition. And I think by offering that to all of our employees, this mm -hmm. whole wellness stuff, yep. I think makes a big difference because giving me a trainer who's going to force me to lift weights every day, there's no way I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for a day. I'm going to hate it and never going to do it again. So finding that balance, mm -hmm. right? is is really what's making it successful for us yeah i think that personalization uh is critical it's there is no more one size fits all uh you yep. have to have that and what you're offering is a personal well-being coach to every individual that can identify what will work for you what will move the needle and take it in digestible you know increments <laughs> so yep. and then you build it take up what right? you take what you can get something is better than nothing and then eventually, you know, your tolerance level, your health will improve. You can do more. And so Absolutely. I love that. And you had said something that I think is very insightful that I think is important. And it, it's not selfish as it may come off to be, but in the sense that, hey, look, if they're not healthy mentally, physically, physically, some will lead to mental, mental health issues, you know, they're not going to come to work. They're not going to be productive at work. They're not going to be happy individuals. They're not going to be confident individuals. So there is, there is a benefit to the organization for keeping people healthy, both mentally and physically, uh, and making sure that. So I love that you you already have a program. You're a very progressive company, one of the most progressive companies that I've met. You care deeply about your employees. Uh, that's why you keep them. It's why you, you know, you're able to promote them. They'll stay with you for a long time. It's, you know, you have a lot of tenure within your organization. Uh, and I want to give you a minute just to kind of plug eTech a little bit. Tell everybody what you, what eTech does and if they want to contact you, how they can contact you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and before I go into that, I will give you one story though. It comes around self-awareness. Hmm. If your leadership has self-awareness of their employees, it's a game changer. And I'll give you a true story. You know me for 10 plus years in the industry. You know I'm out traveling all the time. Yep. You know I love people. Yeah. My boss called me during COVID because he knew I was about to break. And he said to me, get yourself on a plane. I don't care where you and Kelsey go. You need to take a break before you lose it. Hmm. Which not everybody would do that. Of course, I right. went to Vegas, just so we're clear. <laughs> but I... <laughs> But it's like, those are the things you have to be that self-awareness. But mm. to tell you what eTech does, we are a global business process outsourcing. We're a contact center. That's our, our bread and butter. That's what we do best. Secondly, we're an analytics company, as you know. We have integrated your platform into our quality management tools. So we have a, a whole total quality management solution, which is QA on steroids, which holds people accountable. Um, and it actually shows you who to coach, what to coach, and how to coach. And last but not least, as you know, you've used some of our people in the past. We have a full line of full, uh, we have over 100 full stack developers that help companies who want to outsource some of their IT work, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be developing a website or doing some integrations and things like that. Those are the top three things we do. But at the end of the day, what we always say, we're in the people business because whatever technology you have is the technology is an enabler. It's the people that are successful that drive the business. And we are a people culture focused company. And I think that's why we're successful. I, anybody that wants to work with you, we're going to put up, give us a, your website address. We'll put that up on the screen here. We'll give the handles to your social media as well. Uh, but if anybody wants to come and work, it sounds like it's a great and amazing place to work. Uh, if people want to do business with you, um, let them know how to reach you. Is there a phone number or website? Sure. You can go to www.etechgsforglobalservices.com. Um, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, Jim Ayub, there's not a lot of Ayubs out there, as you know, 
Um, I, I'm very passionate about speaking. Um, I don't sell on social media, but I do provide content, as you know, and you can subscribe to my newsletter and you can contact me there as well. Beautiful. You have a ton of great content out there. I love watching you speak, especially at the conferences we're both attending. All right. Before we wrap things up here, we are a gamification company, as you know, and we we our podcast is uh, the Zizzo Effect, all things gamify. So we like to play a game uh, at every sure. one of our podcasts. And for this season, what we're doing is we're playing with our guests and it's trivia. I'm going to awesome. have uh, Emma, our producer, come on. I love competition. I have my buzzer here. What is the capital city of Australia? I, uh, I have no clue. S- Sydney. Is it Sydney? That's what I was thinking. Thanks. Oh, uh, hold on. All right. Well, no, I don't think I get another chance. Jim, do you want to take a crack at it? Nope. Pass. Next. I don't know that one. Next question. Melbourne. Oh. <laughs> I thought you had it. It's the only two cities I really know in Australia. What is the chemical symbol for gold? AU. Oh, that's huge. In what year was the first iPhone released? 91. All right, I am going to say 99. Dang. 2007, Damn. man, we're old. Yeah. What is the tallest mountain in the world? Killing the Jemma. Uh, K2. Everest. Everest. I don't know. I For some reason, I thought it was K2. I knew it was Everest, but I don't know why I guessed K2. I, that won't count because I had two guesses. Go on. Who painted the Mona Lisa? Michelangelo. Da Vinci? Oh, no. Da Vinci. I That's not it three. either? No, it's Da Vinci. Oh, okay. I don't know why. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm off today. You're smarter than me. <laughs> Go ahead. Which planet is known as the red planet? Mars. Mars. That's yeah. easy. Yeah. I like the easy questions, just for the record. Who discovered electricity? Tesla. Is it Benjamin Franklin with the kite? Okay, good. Oh, it is? Yeah. I mean, that's what I oh, learned. You're right. You're right. You're right. The that's what we learned. The, the kite. Yeah. You're right. What is the world's largest ocean? Well, we only have a handful to choose from. I'm going to go Pacific. I'll go with Atlantic then. <laughs> is it Pacific? All right. Oh. <laughs> is that five? Ah, oh, killed me. Killed nice. me. Nice. Nice. I win this one, Jim. I'm, I, you're, you're a wealth of knowledge, so I was shocked that I was able to beat you. <laughs> um, but again, Jim Ayub, thank you so much for coming on the Zizzo Effect podcast. It's been a pleasure. Uh, everybody knows how to contact you. We'd love to have you on again. Uh, looking forward to seeing you at the next conference that we're going to be at together. Uh, for Absolutely. our audience, this has been a great episode. Thank you for joining us. And remember, at the Zizzo Effect, it's game time. I definitely want to come back because I got to get my reputation back from being being so knowledgeable. I knew none of those. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to seeing you in person. I appreciate you guys so much. That was such a great and insightful chat with Jim Ayub. It's always refreshing to hear from someone who knows the true power of investing in people and sticking to core values. Jim really drove home how these principles are the backbone of ETEC and how important it is to the success of any organization. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you on the next episode. And remember, it's game time.